Hi, welcome to the fourth part of my deep dive into parallax. So far, we've talked about the parallax effect and how to apply it in a bunch of different ways, particularly animating along the y-axis with various offsets. In this episode, we're going to talk about animating things along a complex path based on your scroll position. So here's the end result of what we're going to be making. You can see as I scroll down, we get this light bulb that animates its position both on the x and y axis along this path, following the contours of this mask that we want it to follow. We're going to start with our static content laid out sitting on the page, as well as our light bulb image. All the artwork that we're using was built in Adobe Illustrator and then saved out as SVG. So here you can see the actual mask that we're using. And what we're going to do to get our path and create it visually is actually do the same thing in Illustrator. We're going to use our path in Illustrator and save that out as SVG. And then copy and paste our SVG code from Illustrator into our HTML file. So here you can see the path laid on top of all of our artwork. And this is the path that our light bulb is going to follow. I also want to note that I added a semi-transparent black rectangle to fill the SVG content just so that when we deal with SVG scaling, we can make some calculations based on how that changes. The first thing we're going to do is collect a few variables for reference. So we're going to get our SVG element itself, the path element or polyline that we're using to create our path. We're going to reference our light element within our document and also that background rectangle that we're going to be using for some sizing metrics. Now we're going to get the bounding client rectangle of that background rectangle. And this is going to be used to get the offset within the document of the scroll position. We're then going to get the points attribute of our path. So you can see our points is made up of a string that contains a bunch of X and Y values that are comma delimited and then space delimited for each point. So we're going to collect those into a string. We're then going to use a regular expression to split up this string into a flat array of numbers. So we're going to split it by both the space and the comma characters and iterate through the entire string. And this is going to get us a flat array of alternating X and Y values. Next, we're going to store half of the window's inner height and the height of our SVG element and save those as variables. Now what we're going to do is take that array of numbers that we generated representing all of our points and convert it into an array of point objects. So these are going to be objects with X and Y values. So we need to iterate over our point array. Then we're going to parse this because they come back as strings. So we're going to parse float the value and add it to the left of our rectangle. So this is going to help us out with how SVG scales within the document. Then we're going to get the Y value and get that from I plus one because every other number in our array is the Y value. This means that we need to increment I by two rather than just one. We then push these objects into the array with the X and Y values subtracted by half the width and half the height of our light element. And this will get us the origin center so that we're transforming it based on the center position of our element. Next, we're going to leverage Greensock's tween max to create a Bezier tween between all these points. So we have to include the tween max library. And here's the CDN URL. We then create our tween, tweening our light object with a duration of one that we're going to store as a variable. And then we create the Bezier tween, passing in the values that we stored in that object array. So now if we test this, you can see that it's actually animating along that path in a Bezier curve. 
Of course, we don't want it to automatically play through this animation, so what we need to do is set its initial state to paused. Now you can see we've prevented it from animating right away. And what we're going to do is actually set the position of the timeline based on the scroll position. The next part's going to be very similar to what we discussed in the previous episode, so it may seem a bit like review, but we're essentially doing the same concept. We're going to create an event listener for the scroll event on our window. This is going to update our rect variable with the background elements, get bounding client rect. So this is going to give us the position of this element relative to the, the top of our viewport. Next, we're going to create our animate method, which is going to update all the values of the elements being drawn on the screen. So first we get our element center position relative to the top of the viewport. To do this, we get the rectangle top, which is that rectangle's top position relative to the top of the viewport, and add half of the rectangle height, which we stored from earlier. Then we get the difference between that and the center of our viewport. So we subtract the element center from the window center. And we're going to invert this value different from last time because of the values of the timeline. Then we set our time variable to this distance from center and we set our tween's time value to that number. Then we need to loop our animation frame using request animation frame. So if we preview this and scroll down to the bottom, you'll see it's at the end of our timeline. It's at the end of the animation. And if we scroll up, you'll see, it might be hard to see, but it's actually animating really fast. So what we need to do is reduce the numbers that we're getting because the timeline, the duration of our timeline and our tween is from zero to one. So this is the period where it's going from the beginning of the animation to the end of the animation. It's one second. So the numbers we're getting are actually more reflective of milliseconds. So we need to divide this number value by 1000 to get a more reasonable value. Then we need to subtract it by half a second, so half of our duration. And this is so that when it's in the center of the viewport, it will be in the middle of our animation. So now if we preview this, we can see it animating a longer path like we wanted and it's at the middle of the animation, the midpoint of the path, when it's in the center of the viewport, just like we wanted. So one thing to notice is we're getting these really big curves. As it's hitting the points, it's arcing a lot and creating these Bezier curves through each of these points. So one thing we can do is go back into our tween and adjust some properties and adjust the curviness of these angles so that we get a more exact following of our path. By setting our curviness to zero, we can get a really precise animation exactly along our path. So now we can do some cleanup and just move our light bulb image behind our cave mask element. We'll also hide the visibility so set the opacity to zero of our SVG element that contained our path. So now if we preview this, you can see we basically have the exact effect we want where we have this light bulb animating along the path. But if you look at the beginning, there's a spot where it's kind of arcing into the path. And this is because its starting point is actually its initial element start point, which is the upper left part of this element. So we need to set the initial start point. So we need to set the tween position of the element to the first point. And there you have it. We've got our effect of our masked image of the light bulb animating through the cave along this Bezier path as we scroll through the content. That's it. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.